when the, the, the talk about the commons yesterday after the presentation of the fellows at the end of the presentation. And with the question that Yorgos was raising, um, why is it that we have not been talking about the commons uh, that much? Even if the commons are by and large uh, a subject very present in our research, uh, uh, both the rural and the urban. So my, uh, my hypothesis I would try to, um, to illustrate is that uh, the problem might be, the reason might be that we do not have a, a political ecology theory of the economy. How do I go to the next? Um, Down. Down by. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> is the microphone on? Oh, this one. Okay. So we have a number. Uh, so I will. Uh, I will. The, the discussion I would like to uh, to contribute to uh, today and to have with you is how much a political ecology of the commons look like. We have a number of other theories, or rather bodies of literature on the commons. Some of which I will refer to. Uh, in the talk, um, and some of, uh, of which, of course, you have heard about or know about very well, like uh, new institutional economics, cultural anthropology, conservation biology, comparative law. Is this okay? Yep. Comparative law and legal pluralism studies, peasant studies, and sociology, urban studies, and uh, some others uh, that refer to themselves as autonomous Marxism, Marxists like Negri and Hart, George Alphensis, uh, Giovanni Recovery, Susan Medici, David Poggio. So we have all those bodies of literature, I would say, uh, some more theoretical, some more empirical, that we could refer to and use in our work on the Congress. But as far as I can see, we do not have a political ecology body of literature on the commons that try, that try to explain how the commons work or do not work. So, political ecologists typically have adopted um, a historical materialist approach and have been much more keen to explain why and how the commons have been annihilated, destroyed, uh, negated, uh, enclosed, appropriated, and the commons dispossessed as part of a longer continuing social, global social struggle that we understand today also as an environmental struggle or environmental conflict. This makes a, makes a lot of sense if you see political ecology as arising from, but also somehow reacting to, uh, common property uh, uh, studies. Since the uh, publication of an article by, by uh, uh, Siriasi Wontrup and Bishop in 1975, uh, that, um, that was the sort of foundation of, uh, of political ecology studies on the commons. Um, and the, the article was on the concept of common property and its relevance in, in, uh, for natural resource management. And this article argued against Garrett Hardin's tragedy of the commons, that I'm sure you all have heard about. But if you want, I can tell you something more, uh, about it later. Uh, Siliasi Wanchu and Bishop were pointing out how enclosures had historically caused uh, social and environmental tragedies by dispossessions and forced de-ruralization of people. So uh, from, from that perspective, there emerged, in my view, two bodies of literature uh, with a sort of implicit division of labor between the two. One, political ecology, has documented the tragedy of enclosures while the other, common property studies, has documented what uh, Mackay and Eckeson, uh, yeah, but it's not um, <laughs> Mackay and Eckeson call um, the comedy of the, common, of the commons. So 
So the way in which the commons have worked in different contexts and, and different cultures. The dividing line between the two schools, political ecology and common property studies, um, I would say is politics, in the sense that one tends to uh, politicize, politicize and the other to depoliticize or apoliticize the study of the commons. Some uh, Marxist scholars, like George Confensis, have taken this criticism against the, 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 the common property school uh, to the extreme, stating that uh, it can be seen, that school of thought, that school of studies, it can be seen as a way of saving capitalism from itself by demonstrating that the market economy is not in contradiction with cooperation and conservation. I don't know if this is true, but we could reflect uh, uh, on the contrary, uh, on the opposite side, um, and as the Marxist economist proposed, uh, on political ecology uh, as a, a tentative of saving communism from itself, by looking at the commons as a political possibility and the exercise of political imagination. But this is just a provocation I uh, want to launch here for the discussion. I hope that might open afterwards. In any case, if political ecology wants to offer a contribution to the construction of a non-alienated world, communist or else, it becomes essential that we understand not only how enclosures and dispossessions have uh, worked, but also how the commons work, have worked, or may work in the future in a way that does not discount politics, but incorporates it. This seems to me a crucial challenge for political ecologists today. So, in, in, in order to give my contribution to this effort, I will offer a possible systematization of the commons as a topic for a politically and ecologically engaged research. First of all, we need to specify what do we mean by commons. By, especially by distinguishing them from two sorts of confusion, from open access uh, on one side and from public or state property on the other side. Uh, confusing the commons with open access is the major mistake that has been pointed out in the tragedy of the commons uh, theory uh, in, in Harvey's article. Uh, because he was actually talking about uh, an open access regime uh, and uh, all the, the, the common property studies have demonstrated that common property are not open access, they are regulated and they are based on certain characteristics uh, that in, 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 among which there is exclusion of outsiders, etc. Uh, but also distinguish the commons from public property is very important. Uh, because public property, the way it has uh, been historically interpreted and, uh, and, and acted has been uh, as state property. And state property is something very different from the commons. It is a centralizing, uh, cent cent centrally uh, regulated, and the state very often acts as uh, any private entrepreneur and, and dispose of, of land and other natural resources uh, in a market-oriented uh, way. So, as a broadly speaking, the commons can be seen as the undivided property of a community. Common property, in this sense, is the opposite of open access. It is the property of all and each one, rather than the property of nobody. This sounds like a complicated philosophical distinction, but it does make a lot of sense in empirical terms if we consider that sharing access to land and, uh, and natural resources has been a very important way for people to survive throughout history, and it is today still a very important way for people to survive in many contexts. <laughs> this works as far as people see the commons as their property in a non-individualized as the property of the community to which they belong and to which they reproduce. This is what makes the commons something non-distinguishable from the community that lives 
out of them. The key implications of the commons as a highlighted by the specialized literature in the last 30 years are linked to the community dimension. Reciprocity, interdependence, communication, self-regulation, cooperative work, for example, for the maintenance of uh, some kinds of commons like uh, commons like irrigation systems, for example. And the settlement of uh, uh, litigation within the community. These characteristics in turn have been linked to the territoriality of the commons and of the community. That is to the possibility of exclude, excluding others from their use. The specialized literature, especially cultural and ecological anthropology, has also highlighted how the commons have an economic rationale which is at the same time an ecological rationale. That is, they are those goods which does not make sense to divide into individual property. And this is especially true for wildlife, game or fish, for example, or for marginal lands such as alpine pastures or uh, uh, in general mountain, mountain lands, which are subject to a high unpredictability and high environmental vulnerability. The corollary, however, of all the above mentioned characteristics is the relative isolation of a community. Because external inputs coming from markets, technological or cultural change, government interference, uh, all these can disrupt the functioning of the common arrangements that sustain the common. But here it is where a political ecology perspective would come in really handy in order to make sense of the changes in the commons that happen in the real world because no community is really isolated or can be isolated for a long time. And to make sense of how those changes are related to broader political economy scenarios and dynamics, to national or supranational governmentalities and environmentalities, to discourses of sustainability or development, etc. And how all these things bring about a politicization of the commons. So commons and communities have been historically interlinked in the sense that the enclosure and privatization of the commons has been the main factor in moving people, pushing people out uh, from the country to the city, causing so, the disappearance of many rural communities. Carl Polanyi described this process uh, in his Great Transformation, and particularly in one chapter called uh, uh, Habitation and Improvement or actually it was improvement versus habitation uh, by which he meant the dislocation of rural people from their living and working environments from the place they inhabited in order to allow agrarian landowners to uh, introduce improvements in the land after imposing it into individual properties. Today we, we would call this land grabbing. But the opposite is also true. In fact, after communities disappear from the local map, local knowledge and local work, which are crucial to the maintenance of the commons, also disappear. Commercial seeds replace the ones selected and saved for generations that were better adapted to local climate and soil conditions. Pharmaceuticals replace medicinal plants Industrial monoculture replaced polycultures that were much more resilient to environmental stress and capable of sustaining and saving people from starvation during you know, times of crisis, etc. As a result, people become more and more dependent on some kind of larger social order, which becomes the provider of food, water, medicine, energy, etc. Everything becomes either a commodity or service 
provided by some agency upon which people have less and less control. A third way to see the relationship between commons and communities is that indicated by uh, the Japanese, for example, Emma or Nero, in their studies on the struggles over public order and against garbage disposal in the neighborhood. They point out how the urban environment of conflict creates communities that were not there before, or recreates communities that had been profoundly restructured by the urbanization <coughs> of the outskirts. In the conflict to defend a common good like the social movements call them to for today, individuals recognize themselves as part of a community that they did not see before in the sense that they share the same territory. And this is a word which has become absolutely central in, uh, to the social movements uh, that organize the struggles, territory. And thus they share the same air, water, soil, the same urban setting, the same landscape. Moreover, in fighting for the commons that are life supporting systems of the community in its territory, they rediscover the value and meaning, meaning of commons. In the course of the struggle, people have rediscovered that a third way that must exist between private goods and uh, public goods or state property. But I hope that Chapman might want to tell us more about this later. So commons and communities, uh, as it should now be clear, are not free of conflict or contradictions. And here it is that political ecology is best suited to uncover the way commons work in the real world. In order to understand the politicization of the commons, scholars in agrarian history and rural sociology have taken as point of departure and here we can hear the strong disapproval of my French colleague, environmental historian, because they have taken as a point of departure, departure Karl Marx's article, Debates on the Law on Tax of Goods, published in 1842. An article in which Marx directly addressed the land grabbing problem in his own time, and specifically the way in which the state was protecting the puzzle papers the appropriators of the common land, while criminalizing those former commoners who had now become, in legal terms, the test of good. In that article, Marx stated, it will be found that not only that this class feels an urge to satisfy a natural need, the need of good, for example, but equally that it feels the need to satisfy a rightful urge. Based on Marx's vision of the commons as a political right to nature coming from the material needs of the poor, others like Nancy Peluso, Guahen Gajil in India, Siva Ramakrishnan uh, for Southeast Asia, Manoa Gonzalez de Molina and others for Spain, or Marc Arniero for Southern Italy, have addressed the study of the commons in their historical contradictions using a set of key common concepts that I uh, list here. First, the moral economy concept that was um, um, a concept coming from social history, from, from epitomes, um, highlighting how the, the, the the economy of the peasant in the pre-capitalistic uh, regimes was, was oriented towards reproduction much more than uh, towards production. Uh, this as opposed to the political economy of access to and control over resources um, uh, of which uh, Nancy Cruz and Michael Woods was talking in their violent environment implying forms of violent appropriation of territorialization based on race, taste, or class. Uh, another uh, key concept of these studies has been government mentality in the sense 
of the um, aim of the state to impose uniform, uh, uniform um, forms of uh, measurement and legibility of nature and of space and imposing also the territorialization in the sense of, uh, of uh, sedentarization of nomadic people and all these all these adapted as forces which operate to disaggregate the commons as anti-commons forces but they operate within they operate in the commons but the commons still exist and environmentality in the sense of uh, conservation and natural resource management as policies that aim at centralizing control over the commons of the, of the, of the land and water and, uh, and natural resources. Also taking control over these resources out of the local communities and entrusted to some central authority that's supposedly better suited to, uh, to conserve, to save them, to save them. So the first way to understand the commons is to take into consideration the geohistorical context of which they are part. We should not assume the commons ontologically as an ahistorical institution embodying anything traditional and timeless. I will make the example of the European context, which is the one I know better, and which of course is not generalizable to other geohistorical contexts, but rather becomes globally relevant because it, it has interacted in important ways with uh, the history of the commons in the colonized areas. That interaction was very important not only for the colonized people, but also for the European commons. In fact, as law historian Paolo Rossi showed in a wonderful book, which is translated into English, called Another Way of Assessing, the European juridical debate of the late 90s, late, sorry, late 19th century, which definitely sanctioned the delegitimation of common property and the universal value of private property in juridical terms, that debate was deeply influenced by comparison with property institutions of the colonized people and especially of indigenous and aboriginal populations of Latin America and Australasia that were considered by the emerging anthropological science as the remnants of the original human condition, the state of nature, over which modern civilization had raised. So the same theories were used to stigmatize and condemn as definitely backward and uncivilized those peasants of the European countryside who still maintained common property institutions. Progress and improvement, it was believed, would never come out of those institutions. Thus, they had to be abolished, uh, no matter how much contested this process was in social terms. So, anti common laws were enacted between the end of the 19th century and the, the early 20th in a pretty all European countries. And they were not just a legalization of class interests and class visions, but they assumed the character of a true political economy of the nation, of the general interest of the all citizens in the name of progress and civilization. But before that, before the great transformation took place, and of course not badly after, the European commons have been continuously created, contested, and recreated through institutional changes, war, revolutions, and political economic reforms. Mostly, their origins have been seen in the fall of the Roman Empire and the, the feudal, the advent of feudalism. A social system in which private property had a very little relevance, or almost none. Does this mean that we should look at medieval Europe as a model society, a viable alternative between, uh, uh, to both capitalism and state socialism? Of course not. And this is where uh, our study of the commons 
has to take on a critical historical approach. The point is that the broader institutional context in which the commons are found is very important. If this is Europe's feudal system, or India's caste system, for example, or the former Soviet system of the USSR, then the commons will be inevitably written with the different kinds of contradictions and conflicts that uh, social questions that characterize each of those systems. So we should avoid to idealize or ontologize the commons. They are to be seen as a social process, a political project, always in progress, and to be fought for or against and negotiated by each generation and within different external conditions. This is the, the, the I, I will not go into details of each of these. This were, this were here just to recall a long, the long history of the struggle of the commons in, uh, in modern Europe and the, the, all the different uh, uh, periods in which the commons had to be renegotiated and fought for and fought against in each of these two periods. I will now address some aspects of this historical, political ecology of the commons by focusing on the case of southern Indian commons between the late feudal era and the age of revolution, mostly drawing from my own research and that of my family. So in 1806, a feudal commission was instituted by Napoleon who had come to, to southern Italy to Italy to uh, <coughs> incorporated to its uh, empire with the aim of dividing the ex-feudal lands between the ex-feudatories as private owners and the rural communities as property of the town corporation that in Italy is called the Comune. These lands, those assigned to the Comune, were called the land. The town corporations, however, which were completely controlled by the rural elite, further divided the demani into, this two, into two groups of land. One, and typically the most productive, were rented out to tenants in order to increase cash revenues for the commune, so they were the commune, so they were, they were managed in a capitalist, agrarian capitalism regime. Only the leftovers, so to speak, were left undivided, undivided as a property of the local poor for the exercise of their use rights according to a variety of local customs, mostly unwritten and always, uh, uh, always un in a process of, uh, of negotiation and renegotiation between the peasants and the local elite. But it is important to highlight that local customary rights were very differentiated uh, from one commune to the other, from one area to the other, also as a form of adaptation to local climate and environmental conditions, plant and game species, topography, soil composition. So what most characterized the demand of southern Italy and this is also true for the commons elsewhere, as, a, as for example, Due and Gaggio have demonstrated for India, was the plurality of use and consequently of use rights that insisted upon the same plot of land. And this is why it didn't make sense to divide, to partition the land into individual properties. Because different rights of access and different uses were uh, practiced on the same land. Such diversity of use oriented towards subsistence and reproduction rather than cash crop was an important rationale for the non-division of the commons. And it allowed for larger and more complex ecosystem services and productivity. So it also allowed for a higher resilience of this uh, ecosystem. On the other hand, it was precisely such institutional diversity that was targeted by the modern state 
and the, the new rural elite, the emerging agrarian bourgeoisie that came to rule, the, rule over the countryside in, in the 19th century. Because they saw it, this diversity of institutions and diversity of uses, they saw it as a formidable obstacle to improvement and, and, and accumulation. And from the state point of view, it was also a formidable obstacle to taxation. How, how, to, how to tax this kind of income? So the modern state and the new agrarian theory, and one that, that has described this process very well is, uh, is James Scott in his book, Seeing Like a State, that addressed, especially the first chapter, addressed this issue of uh, how the state tends to uniform, uh, uniformize the um, commons. Um, so the modern state and the new gradient elites uh, had entirely new ideas, different ideas of property than those of the peasants. Property to them can only be two, of two kinds, either state property or individual property. And this is of course the idea that came to, to, to be accepted all over Europe at the same time. But the, the superimposition of this idea, this simplifi simplified idea of property had uh, a strong uh, post, a strong social conflict. To the Italian state, the commons were just another manifestation of the backwardness of southern peasants and of their wild character. After the political unification of the country in 1860, a real war was waged by the state against the southern regions and indirectly against the commons of the rural communities of the south. Those regions, as Joanne has demanded us, have been considered by this historiography as primitive weapons. And that should instead be seen as they should instead be seen as the expression, the extreme expression of a political and ecological project, albeit not one that the Marxist left would consider progressive, that's for sure. Brigands were in fact um, an extreme expre expression of both the urgent need of and the rightful urge of southern people to maintain control of their commons within a moral economy system. <coughs> But at the same time, they defended the territory of the nation by fighting for the Bourbon monarchy against the Piedmontese, against the new state. They saw the unification of the country as a territorial conquest. So they were not primitive at all. They were nationalistic, defending the homeland from external attack in the name of the social rights that they enjoyed as citizens of the Bourbon state. But what is interesting from a political ecology perspective is that the end of the commons of southern Italy also brought about great environmental distress. The extensive diffusion of private property land in the first half of the 19th century and, and especially in the second half uh, even more, implied huge deforestation and building of land that, due to the mountainous nature of the country, were mostly located on the slopes of the Apennines. The combination of altitude and Mediterranean climate, with its high concentration of rains and extreme weather events, caused a strong increase in environmental vulnerability and hydrological risk which came soon to be recognized and analyzed by contemporaries. And this increased the hydrological risk of the Mediterranean in the 19th century, formed the basis of modern Western conservation ideas through the work of an American who was, happened to be in Italy in that period, called George Perkins Marsh, who was um, an American ambassador to Italy, and at the same time he was a scholar um, of, let's say, a geographer. He was a geographer. And he wrote a book called uh, Man and Nature, 
that became the sacred text, uh, founding text of, uh, uh, of North American and, and also European conservationism in the, the late 19th century. So that book was based on the observations he was doing upon the hydrolog increased hydrological risk in the Mediterranean area of that time. The topographical and climatic specificity of southern Italy interacted with the social process of land enclosure, producing a particular new configuration of environmental risk and social vulnerability. So the history of the commons of southern Italy, which I have only broadly synthesized, speaks to the key issues that I had elencated before as elements of a political ecology of the commons. Because it crucially links the socio-political with the environmental by showing how the commons allowed for greater diversity and thus higher resilience in a fragile ecosystem such as the Mediterranean uplands, while at the same time they allowed for the surviving and reproduction of rural communities. Reasons which both explain why they were so strongly defended and fought upon throughout the 19th century and even in the 20th by a variety of legal and illegal means, and why they were persistently considered a political problem or a political opportunity, depending from the point of view of the state or the revolutionaries. Still in the second half of the, of the 20th century, landless peasants organized to occupy uncultivated lands belonging to either the state or to local landowners in southern Italy and in Sicily in particular, but throughout southern Italy. This was soon after the Second World War had ended. So they occupied uh, those lands <clears throat> through what I would define as acts of insurgent labor by collectively filling and sowing those lands so as to make them productive and thus claiming them for the community. Not very different from what, what's happening today with the urban farming. It was a revolutionary interpretation of the Lockean theory of property based on labor. You may know that John Locke, the English philosopher, was laying one of the foundations of Western thinking about property, saying that property in land is justified by uh, man mixing his labor with the soil, with the land, and that justifies, that is the foundation for the appropriation of that land. But while Locke was, was talking about private individual appropriation, for the landless uh, peasants of southern Italy, they reinterpreted this in a collective sense. In the sense that did not turn the common into private property via the incorporation of labor, but the opposite, it turned private or state unproductive land into commons. Nobody so far has studied this movement in a political ecology perspective, so we can only wonder what might have been the ecological implications of uh, this revolutionary reinterpretation of the labor of property. In any case, what we do know is that the movement was broadly repressed and depoliticized through the enactment of an agrarian reform by the state, an agrarian reform that firmly re-established the principle of individual property as the only acceptable form of relationship to land. 150 years after the abolition of feudality, the demani of southern Italy were finally partitioned and assigned to the peasants in individual family lots. But being those the most marginal and less productive lands, the leftovers, as I, as I said before, because all the other land had been already appropriated, their division into individual properties was an ecological and economic disaster. In fact, most of them were soon, soon uh, abandoned or resold for different uses 
while the peasants of southern Italy took the final road to migration, out migration, and their communities disappeared. I would like to suggest two possible lines of investigation of the commons from a political ecology perspective. The first would be um, the stigmatization uh, or delegitimization of the commons as uh, a historical and cultural process which has accompanied the, the rise of uh, and social hegemony of private property in Western institutions since the early modern age by associating the commons with ideas of backwardness, waste, and poverty. And associating the private property with ideas of freedom, progress, and development. I think one particularly interesting aspect of this process from a political ecology perspective is how the result of this line of thought has been the idea that the commons were enemies with the conservation and environmental stability because they were irrationally used by ignorant and wild people who did not properly care for conserving and stabilizing the ecosystems. I think it would be quite interesting to go deeper into the analysis of that discourse than those discourses and how they have evolved into modern day conservation science and policy. Second, the commons as political or the politicization of the commons, the struggle to defend, for example, in indigenous lands, or reappropriate, for example, in, uh, in the battle for public water, or, or, raise or invent new commons, for example, the extractive reserve uh, commons that have, been, uh, have become law in Brazil in the Brazilian Amazon, or urban farming. Like primitive accumulation, also the, the politicization and the struggle, the battle of the commons, is a long-term recurring social process that accompanies the whole history of capitalism. The struggle to defend, reappropriate, and reinvent the commons is made of countless single struggles experienced by people in organizations on a daily basis around the world. It is made of direct action, occupation, public protest, and physical confrontation with police or other forms of violence in many cases. But it is also made of organization work, group discussions, books, talks, storytelling. Words have a very important part in the struggle. And so does science be it natural science or social and human science. Because science is used to inform or justify, justify both public policies and social movement action. In this sense, I would say that the most important challenge for a political ecology of the commons today is to become relevant, both scientifically and in the public arena. Political ecologists cannot and should not stay confined in their privileged intellectual circles, exercises that find criticism of, uh, of capitalism or, or state environmental politics. They have to get out there and become publicly relevant. They have to go hegemonic if they want to be of any use to anyone. How to do this, or is it even possible to do this, are of course questions that we have been discussing and I hope we will continue to discuss in this summer school. I hope we can now actually continue this discussion, this conversation, by grounding it into our own research projects and making an exercise and imagining how our own work can research and contribute to today's public of the commons.